Welcome back, everyone. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, my name is Molly Westling. I'm in the English department and the environmental studies program here at the university. And I'm just here to introduce the introducer. This is Professor Ted Toadvine in the philosophy department. Uh, who does environmental philosophy and has a wonderful book on Merleau-Ponty's philosophy of nature. Um, and he will take it away and introduce the first speaker. So welcome to the second day of our conference on biosemiotics and culture. Uh, as Molly said, I'm Ted Toadvine in the Department of Philosophy and Environmental Studies program. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Sohan Breer. He's professor in the Semiotics of Information, Cognition, and Communication Sciences at the Department of International Business Communication at Copenhagen Business School. He's the creator of the transdisciplinary framework Cyber Semiotics, which is now described in several international encyclopedias, dictionaries, and handbooks in linguistics, semiotics, cybernetics, and system science. He is also the founder and editor-in-chief of the quarterly interdisciplinary journal cybernetics and human knowing, and co-founder of the International Association for Biosemiotic Studies and its journal, Biosemiotics. In fact, the most recent issue of Biosemiotics, just published last month, is a special issue dedicated to information in biosemiotics that was guest edited by Professor Breer and Cliff Joslin. He's a former trustee for the American Society for Cybernetics, which awarded him the Warren McCulloch Award and a fellowship. He is also a former member of the board of the Socio-Cybernetics Group of ISA and a member of the scientific board of the Science of Information Institute and the Foundation of Information Science Group. In addition to dozens of articles and book chapters devoted to cyber semiotics, information theory, person and semiotics, and related themes, he's also the author of a monograph titled Cyber Semiotics, Why Information is Not Enough which was published by Toronto University Press in 2008 and in 2010. Please join me in welcoming Professor Breer. Am I on? Oh, on. Is it working? OK. Now we just need the beamer to work. OK, the beam is working, warming up. I hope I will warm up from my jet lag <coughs> soon. <laughs> Didn't take off. OK. Um, Thank you for inviting me. Um, I have, uh, like many others here, a background in biology, um, but also some background in psychology and in um, cybernetics. So I have been interested in the um, intersection between uh, biosemiotics and, and cybernetics. Um, I shared with Jesper in the early years of interest in, in Gregory Bateson, so that's the reason why I was uh, attracted to the American Society for Cybernetics and the journal I'm editing was originally made in collaboration with people from the American Society of Cybernetics and uh, it still is. Uh, Philip Gudeme is sitting down there, is a uh, managing editor and is working with the American Society of Cybernetics and the Bateson Group. So that's my interest in, in, in making this framework. So the basis of this talk is this book uh, was mentioned here earlier. Um, it came out in, in 2008 and 2010. And uh, if you're interested, you can find it as a Google book where you will find many of the um, models and things I'm, I'm using in this talk. Um, I don't think I need to have this one. 
up here somehow. And we're actually going to make a PhD course uh, in, in Simon Sibjanic uh, this August uh, with a few guest speakers you might have heard of. Uh, some of them are actually here. Uh, other uh, Danish colleagues uh, are also working with biosemiotics uh, like um, Klaus Emeke and Frederick Sternfeld. Um, so if anybody's interesting, interested, you can find this very easily on the net. Now what I'd like to investigate here is how we're going to look at biosemiotics, how we're going to place it in the interdisciplinary view of uh, disciplines. Um, I'm earning my living in doing courses in philosophy of science and interdisciplinary philosophy of science in mainly uh, communication programs at, uh, at the business school. Is biosemiotic going to be seen as a bridge uh, between CP Snow's two cultures? Uh, are we going to have the quantitative cultures, scientific cultures here and the humanities and the qualitative studies on, on the other side? And are we going to imagine that Biosemiotic somehow is going to bridge uh, this uh, gap between these two cultures. I've traveled from one of them into the other. I'm right now in a basically humanities department working with uh, linguistics and culture, international communication. And um, I've been in brought up with physics and chemistry and biology and went into uh, behavioral studies of animal and the European biological behavioral discipline ethology and studied that and its uh, paradigmatic background and kind of explanatory types and went from there into psychology to look at how far those kind of biological explanations could be taken into uh, the human realm. Um, and that travel going from, I, I realized then that it was going from one universe into another universe and it was quite a shock to arrive in this other universe that spoke a completely different language, hardly recognized the place where I came from. Um, I had trouble in in biology because I had this philosophy of science interest and historical interest in types of explanation. Um, and so my supervisor actually left me when I was about to, to finish my master's um, and I studied some psychology on the side. And these guys then came and, and helped me finish the master's uh, with the help of Jesper Hochmeier who saved me at that time. Uh, he was one of the only few biologists then actually doing philosophy of science on biology. Um, so I managed to get a scholarship in biology. Now these guys working with animal behavior, they were down in the basement. I mean, they were not really part of psychology. So it was a very interesting move. They were there together with the behaviorists, <coughs> although they did not agree. They rest of them agreed that they really didn't belong in psychology. So you have these two very uh, different cultures. Uh, and um, if you look at, at this uh, problem, uh, part of it is public because it, the divide was made before evolutionary theory became prominent. And the problem they have today is that evolutionary theory kind of force them to integrate in, in uh, ways um, and they don't have any way to integrate. They don't have any uh, paradigms or concepts really to do that. So I tried to make a map of these two cultures. Uh, if you see to your left, it must be, um, we have the universe of the sciences. I live in the universe as a scientist, but my 
fellow um, my colleagues at, at the institute, they live in the cultural universe where nature is an interesting concept that changes over time. But when I'm a biologist, I live in the universe where culture is an interesting but rather late thing in the uh, development of the universe as such doesn't play an important role. We'll try to get around it if we can. And just looking for the laws of nature. Um, on the other hand, you have in the culture, they are living in, in meaning and communication and interpretation. But we're not allowed to do that in the sciences. I mean, the sciences are built up on the concept of that there's no meaning in the universe no meaning to look for. If we look for meaning in the universe, we are crossing over into theology. And uh, an important part of uh, the self-esteem of the sciences is that there are uh, an alternative to theology. They uh, try to, they still have this positivistic uh, flavor that, that uh, we're getting out of theology we're getting out of politics and theology. They are unnecessary. Scientific rationality will solve most of these problems. So the way they uh, proceed is very much in making mathematical models. They produce technology. Do we have anything to point with here? No? Oh, yeah. Well, so the way the, the two cultures interact is actually that these guys export mathematical models and technology to these guys. And these guys produce meaning and epistemology to these guys. Most of it they don't like. And, and on the other hand, I mean, people, many people from humanity don't like technology either. So uh, it's an interesting uh, way of uh, exporting to each other. Uh, the yeah, uh, there it was one of the last thing uh, exchanged uh, we called the science wars where constructivists try to undermine the authority of the sciences uh, and uh, it went the other way too with the SoCal affair um, so although uh, Snow wrote his book in, in the early 50s. Not much has changed uh, these days. It's still a, a gap. What I was pondering is then there seem to be no common reality between these two camps. I mean, we, we don't share a common reality here. Uh, we have this dead and mechanical uh, nature over here, and we have the living experiential reality over here, and um, they don't seem to agree on any kind of uh, common reality as such. Let's take an example from Mary Bonti, from the phenological of Phenomenology of Perception, where he uh, gives the phenomenological attitude toward uh, the how to place scientific and even social science explanations in the philosophical framework where he says that science has not and never will have by its nature the same significance qua form of being as a world which we perceive for the simple reason that it is a rational or an explanation of that world. I am not a living creature, nor even a man, nor again even a consciousness endowed with all the characteristics with which zoology, social anatomy, or inductive psychology recognize in these various products of the natural and historical processes. I am the absolute source. My existence does not stem from my antecedents, from my physical and social environment. Instead, it moves out towards them, sustain them, for I alone bring into being for myself the tradition which I elect to carry. In this, Mary Ponty is not saying that 
scientific explanations are of no value. We just say when we discuss the problem of consciousness or Again, now I'm already using scientific terms by calling it the problem of consciousness. But in, from the phenomenological view, there's one reality. They don't start by sectioning uh, reality into subjects and objects as such. They deal with the real thing as it is. And as such, the scientific explanations are already a... Uh, theoretical construct uh, of uh, describing uh, reality, but it will never be more fundamental than the phenomenological uh, view. Um, Hearst uh, also does in phenomenology, this is called phenoloscopy. Um, and if you go to the other side, you'll find the idea <coughs> that the physical descriptions of the universe are the most basic descriptions of reality. And that description is the foundation of all kinds of explanations, especially um, it's uh, the cause from where everything can be explained. So the content of my talk here is of course a product of my brain, which is again a product of uh, physical and chemical things going on in, in the brain. And um, later on, evolution was add, so time is going this way. The reality was first physical, uh, and it became living, and then uh, conscious much later in, in the development of, of the universe as such. The idea is very much that the laws are down here and govern things up here. So they would place Melipontus' uh, view up here in the humanities as something to be explained from below. So you have these two complete opposite views of what is the most kind of fundamental explanations, and especially when we come to consciousness and the, the content of consciousness, the, our ability to experience, our ability to produce meaning as such. And um, this again has a lot to do with our concept of a causality. Uh, the efficient causality is mainly uh, based on physical understandings, uh, views that mechanical deterministic based on, on physical equilibrium. Um, so it's supposed to come from physical nature. Um, we can speak about formal causality, which has to do with information, pattern matching, um, algorithmic causality, belonging in the information and computer sciences, um, cybernetic machines and stuff like that, which is not the amount of energy and impulse that is determining what's happening, but it's patterns, but it's still not any kind of meaning. It's not final causality. Yes, but was talking about the Persian idea of uh, or understanding of final causality, which is usually, um, again, um, viewed outside the Persian's framework as something conscious human beings are able to exert. You would have to have a living, embodied, semiotic, experiential, even cultural, linguistic conscious embodied system to have a final causation. So we are having problems with these different kinds of causality explanations that seem to belong, again, to different paradigms that don't really fit together. And it's a quite an embarrassment that we are not able to fit them together as such. If we look at what is happening out there or in here in the universities, there seem to be two major transdisciplinary systems trying to overcome this interdisciplinary problem. Uh, and the one is the cognitive information science. Uh, 
that's now connected to the neurosciences, computer sciences, and working towards uh, pan information, pan computational views. More and more books are coming out now where people not only view the brain as a computer, but have a look at the world as a computer, uh, where they look at, want to explain all kinds of processes by as a, a computational processes. Uh, there's then a realization that the Turing idea of a computer then has to be enlarged somehow to include all kinds of natural processes as such. But this is clearly a movement that is there and it's getting more and more prominent. And on the other hand, we have a Persian semiotic uh, view developing into biosemiotics, uh, moving up towards the humanity. So the model could be like this, the information view is coming from the sciences. We discussed it a bit the first day. Uh, it's a, 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 the Shannon and, and Zena concept of information is uh, based on statisti statistical models and based on a engineering approach. Uh, and it's probably a, a mistake to think that that would be the foundation of a all-encompassing uh, theory of, of information as such. But what has happened is that, that this has been done and it's been working its way up into the biological sciences. I think we also mentioned this idea of explaining uh, the gene as containing information and transforming information from the core of the cell out in the rest and governing the rest of the biological system. So uh, information has been a very important uh, uh, explanatory concept in, in developing modern biology. And um, then it, it's going into the social sciences, um, also through cybernetics and, and system explanations, uh, and ending up in, in the humanities, also giving explanation of consciousness, I mean, development of artificial intelligence and stuff like that um, combined with neuroscience. Now, on the other hand, um, semiotics, which is uh, usually uh, seen as coming from the humanities, this is not true when we talk about Peirce, it's actually a, a chemist by education, but uh, uh, the uh, semiology and the movement of that started in the humanities. And now we see it's um, going into the social science, the psychological science, and now we have biosemiotics and discussion if uh, semiotics can work further. So what are we going to do with these two big interdisciplinary paradigms that are obviously competing with each other? Um, the informational view has technology and money on its side. I mean, it's closely connected to the development of the computer and the computer industry and the internet uh, and a lot of uh, uh, economical uh, theory and uh, rationality theory, game theory and stuff like that. Uh, and the other movement may have not all these uh, strong uh, cases with it. So what I want to do in the rest of uh, this talk is to argue for another way to look at these things uh, and model that might is at least a suggestion of how you could combine these two views that are in, in the way we look at things today incompatible in, in ways. Uh, I call it the cybersemiotic star. And I will explain more later, but the main idea is that that uh, the source of, of knowledge in sim in the middle, if I hear that was uh, that the main prerequisite to have n to produce knowledge is that we have embodied uh, conscious beings in language uh, in some kind of environment that are able to exchange 
meaningful communication with each other. If we are going to have these four ways of looking at things together, we're probably going to change the view we have of them when they were made independently viewed as, well, you can say they each have a fundamentalistic version that wants to explain everything. I mean, the, we have a lot of fundamentalistic physicists today that want to explain everything from Big Bang to cosmology. We have biologists who want to explain the whole world as a living organism. We have people from the social sciences and Marxists and social constructivists who would want, like to explain everything from culture and from cultural concepts. Uh, and we'll have people from phenomenology that would like to explain everything from our experience of the world as such. So how is it possible to have these com contributing to a common map or a common worldview without reducing one to the other? I mean, that's what happened when one of them expand. It's trying to reduce what the other guys are doing into its own paradigm. So we have this turf war going on all the time. Oh. So my interest has been in the possibility of, of uh, creating a transdisciplinary framework uh, where you are able to have all uh, knowledge of these different kinds of, uh, of uh, knowledge types. Um, I'll point out a few places here where it seems to be quite relevant and where you can see we have both practical and conceptual problems uh, in uh, our uh, development of technology and knowledge. It's a com human computer interface uh, problem. Um, the discussion of intelligence, human intelligence versus artificial intelligence, uh, the problem of robotics uh, and intelligence in the robot. Are robots actually embodied beings? Do they have an umbrella or not, for instance, that my colleague Klaus Emich has discussed? Um, I've been working uh, 10 years in a library and information uh, university um, where the problem of document retrieval in these huge databases uh, we have now on the internet is still trying to get over that the machines they're using are based in one culture and what they want to find is based in another culture and the concept of the user or the searcher is very different from what the machines are indexing. Um, <coughs> so the in information retrieval systems uh, are organized in science and technology, but they are searching for, for meaningful queries. Actually, I'm going home to the head of the evaluation committee for a PhD that exactly works on, on, on this question. Uh, in my department, many people worked with uh, machine translation of, of natural languages. Uh, it would be so nice to be able to produce a babel fish. So we'll have an automatic uh, translation of all languages. And it's very difficult for these people to understand why it is so difficult. I mean, they simply don't seem to understand what the problem is. I mean, it has to do with the basic of understanding of what, what language and meaningful communication is as such. And it's very different in, in the two camps. In consciousness studies, we're discussing uh, the hard problem. I mean, how is it will people from the sciences say, and even a lot of biologists, is it that the brain produces consciousness? It's, it has to do that but we have no idea how it does it. We know Amanoff and, and uh, Penrose has a far reaching idea going down to quantum mechanical fields that's gonna give a scientific explanation of, of, of consciousness. Um, and um, imprint academic that is uh, 
the publisher of uh, Cybernetic Human Knowing, also publishes a journal of consciousness studies that has been discussing this problem for the last 15 years or something like that. And they really have these interdisciplinary problems uh, uh, very deep into the whole uh, research area as such. Then there's the data, data versus meaning, uh, the physical robots, perception versus signification. Does a robot actually perceive anything? Is, or is what we're doing radically or qualitatively different from what robots are able to do? We don't have a good question, or it's a good question, we don't have a, an answer to that. Uh, because um, we're still developing robots and developing, trying to develop into that area, but the basic problem is not well understood. The problem of disseminating uh, science into common sense, natural language understanding is a part of them also. And then a matter we discuss a, a lot in the biosemiography community, and which uh, uh, Terence is going to talk about the evolution of life uh, and, and uh, mind from matter. Is that the right way of uh, framing that question or is uh, it's a wrong question? So this part of this movement started uh, in cybernetics when uh, Norbert Wiener took, or was inspired at least by Shannon, uh, the idea of information, which was a purely uh, formal um, mathematical measuring device when he was working in, in Bell companies. And he took that and combined it with the uh, thermodynamic idea of uh, neck entropy and defined information as neck entropy. And his, in his own view, then solved the the body-mind problem, so he had information as uh, res cognitus and, and uh, the neck entropy as uh, res extensor, and so he really thought he did solve that uh, deep two-culture problem by developing uh, uh, this idea of, of information. And it's very clear for, for his, let's quote, uh, where he says that information is information, neither matter nor energy. So it's a completely new realm that is uh, defined in this way. Um, and when then it's, it's combined with later development uh, that started mostly with Gushin, the idea of, of self-organization in nature, dissipative structures, combined with general system theory uh, and emergence, uh, theory, uh, we have uh, an evolutionary idea of how information makes evolution possible. Um, and Bateson, uh, one of those who, who took these basic concepts and made them far more ecological and evolutionary uh, in redefining information now as a difference that makes a difference uh, for a cybernetic mind. Uh, so he's linking information and meaning uh, in an uh, ecological framework um, and uh, in including the whole biosphere. And, and part of the popularity of uh, Baton was his uh, ecological thinking and um, that idea that there is some kind of uh, pattern that connects all the living and this pattern is some kind of uh, uh, cybernetic uh, mind. He has a long definition of it. I shall pick out only four things here. The system shall operate with and upon differences. The system, system shall consist of a closed loop or networks of pathways along which differences and transforms of differences shall be transmitted. So it's not the impulses, it's the differences that are uh, the, what is uh, tran transmitted. 
And that means that uh, most of the events in the system will be energized by the responding part rather than by impact from the triggering part. And then the important concept from cybernetics of uh, feedback, which makes it possible to uh, show self correction is in, in systems and work towards homeostasis. Uh, so these basic characteristics will be what Bateson think of as cybernetic mind. The problem is, of course, that this is still very far away from what a phenomenologist would consider as consciousness or self-awareness in anywhere, and especially well, many philosophers will ask, where are qualia, where are the experiential ability to feel anything, to have uh, sense experiences as such? Um, Nagel would ask, how are you going to explain what it feels like to be a bat, for instance? Uh, with this conceptual framework as such. Now, Bateson didn't actually develop it into a pan-computational philosophy, but it is this way of uh, using uh, information, cybernetics, and system theory, uh, combining them with uh, ecological ev evolutionary view that leads into this uh, pan-informational uh, philosophies. A well, John Archibald Wheeler may be the one who formed the clearest understanding of it. He calls it it's from bit. So information becomes a much more foundational aspect of reality as such. And the aspect of reality that will explain why um, the organization capacity of evolution appears, where self-organization comes from, uh, and um, why life and intelligence develops uh, spontaneously in nature as such. And it explains a lot of those things, but the problem is that it's very doubtful if that is theory is enough to explain the appearance of experiential qualities in natural systems as such. And that's a problem for biosemiotics, of course, also because um, it's a part of our understanding of living beings that differs from general um, biology is that they actually have it experiences are able to make interpretations. This was what I studied in Conrad Lawrence because he was aware he had this problem. He didn't want to be a behaviorist on the one side and he didn't want to be a, um, uh, what, I lost the word. Um, he didn't want to be an idealist on, on, on the other hand and so he wanted to find a specific biological type of explanations of animal um, communication and perception as such. And he run shipwreck on exactly that problem. He was unable to find a way to theoretically uh, describe uh, why animals had mo motivation, why they had an umwelt. He actually um, knew von Uxkull and accepted his idea of the animal umwelt, uh, he talked about that animals have an etogram, they have a selected part of reality in which they react, but why they were reacting on these parts, why they were selecting different things, even at different times in their life, uh, he had great problems of explaining, he invented the idea of motivation, but he couldn't explain what motivation was, he ended up giving physiological explanation, and then he got the Nobel Prize in medicine with uh, Tinbergen and, and von Frisch, who worked with the communication of bees. Uh, but he 
after that, he realized that it was actually not an explanation, not, not a solution to, to that problem. Jerry Fodor is one of those who worked very hard on, on um, developing this kind of model then in an understanding of human language as such. I mean, the idea of mentally is, is very clear. It's the idea that there is a language of thought between the physio physiology of the brain and the natural languages that we see them develop in culture. Uh, it's partly built on Chomsky's idea that there must be a general capacity in all human beings for developing natural languages. And as such, there must be some kind of common factor um, across all cultures. Um, so the joke where a guy says to another, I'm glad I wasn't born in China. Why not? Because I don't speak Chinese. Uh, is to that strange thing that we realize that we could learn to speak any languages in wherever we were born. I mean, if we were born in a completely different culture, we would speak that language. So how is that possible? Well, one idea is that we have this language of thought, this program in the human computer that is the same for everyone and that creates the natural languages. So we, we'll be possible for us to make a quantitative universal science of language capacity. And if we could do that, that would solve all these other problems I discussed about artificial intelligence, by about uh, machine translations and all this kind of stuff. So uh, it's a wonderful view. It's just more difficult to solve than they ex expected as such. You can see the information view uh, developed into this basic idea that this information processing system is what connects humans, machines, animals, organizations, societies, and so on. Um, this idea that it's not the hardware, but it's a software that uh, is uh, the explanation of, of behavior as such. And it makes a um, overly uh, important uh, address to, to conscious logical thinking, uh, understanding is viewed categorically, Cognitive processes are broken into parts of a process like in a computer. Perception is also viewed categorically. Uh, learning is viewed as uh, happening according to formal logic. And language is used as a primary as a formal mechanism. Uh, and the cognitive subject will be seen as a um, computer system of some kind. We'll have this it from bit. And uh, there's this main emphasis is on the syntactical structural aspect in cognition and communication as such. And they, there's even an attempt to explain meaning through semantic network of formally uh, defined concepts, uh, which we have several of in the internet these days also. So this is a grand vision. Um, one of my colleagues, when I was at the Library Information School, there were two chemists made this wonderful figure or model where you can see that all the processes going on here are informational. All the arrows show ex information exchange. Uh, so it's a very clear view, I think, of, of this uh, informational uh, solution on the interdisciplinary problem as such. And it was not just a research article. It, this was one of the main uh, teaching books uh, that were based on, on, on this. The problem is if the dynamics of information is qualitatively different from the dynamics of meaning, are that two different things? I mean, when I do give lectures to people that work with computers, they usually don't think so. And they do expect their computers to become conscious and meaningful in five to 10 years or something like that. They, they 
think it's just a question of how much computational power we have to, to solve this problem. Um, and they don't think that, that there's this existential and, and embodied uh, aspect of uh, felt uh, ex uh, consciousness is a, a real important and, and essential thing as such. Um, and in this group, I'm part of a uh, foundation of information theory. Uh, this problem is discussed very much. It's a very interdisciplinary uh, group. But in general, we are reaching an agreement that the ability to produce meaning in itself is not informational. And that seemed to be the basic assumption that, that that the production of, of meaning is informational for the information paradigm to, to uh, attain this uh, transdisciplinary uh, position. But significance and meaning seems to be something different from uh, information as such. And it, of course, has something to do with how the body brain comes to experience anything at all, which is, uh, seems to be the main problem. The differences between a robot and a uh, embodied feeling, living biological body is not solved yet. Um, but still, that is the basis for making science as such uh, at all. Uh, so perception and communication and discussion of the meaning of things are based in some intrinsic transdisciplinary pattern that can be described, is described by logical, psychological, and sociocultural, and linguistic. Um, and that somehow has to include the phenological informed theory of the observer. So the theory of the, of the observer here is uh, crucial and it's not found in, in information science as such. Um, per sees it, he raises his own uh, theory on the basis of what he called phanaroscopy. He actually knew some of Husserl's work and considered it psychology in some ways um, and uh, tried to uh, make his own foundation um, where he used pure mathematics as his uh, ontology and developed the, these three categories, firstness, secondness, and thirdness. Um, but it's still a phenological uh, point of, of view. So what we see is that we now, we have the humans in the middle, but we have various uh, types of systems. We have now here the divide between the two cultures, and here we'll have the information sciences and cognitive sciences uh, going into the behavioral sciences, physiology, and the what we could call the rationalistic part of the social sciences. And over here we're starting with uh, pragmatic semiotic and language philosophy, phenomenology and hermeneutics. So we still have this divide um, somewhere here there's the living systems, and somewhere here there's a concept of what culture is uh, as such. And you could ask, what would hold this framework together? I mean, what is constructing this framework? How is it possible? I mean, there's no uh, basic idea of information here that is holding it together. Um, there's no basic idea of universal true laws that's holding it together. So how are we going to hold this view together? There's an interesting uh, development in second order cybernetics, which is part of the reason I was uh, attracted to the American side of cybernetics, where I actually met Heinz von Förster, uh, who died now, I think, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and here's a, a quote uh, cut out from a longer one where he says, I have a theory of observing, knowing I am myself an observer, so I am doing the observing. 
I'm including myself into the loop of argumentation and in which way can I handle that? So a serious attempt was made to cope with the epistemological and the methodological Grundlagen propositions that appear if you begin seriously to include the observer in the description of his observations. Um, Humberto Maturana uh, actually uh, came to work with the uh, von Förster in his biological laboratory uh, after the Chilean overtake by, uh, what was his name? Pinochet, thank you. <coughs> Jet lag. <coughs> and, and so he was instrumental in developing this idea of uh, autopoiesis, uh, the idea that the organism is a self-contained, self-organized, self-describing uh, system. Um, it was actually done about the same time that Stuart Kaufman was uh, developing his uh, uh, theory also of Kantian holes. Uh, Stuart uh, not very often uh, referred to Maturana. I asked him, I think 12, 13 years ago when he was giving talks at the Spohr Institute and he claimed that he was the Spohr Maturana. But he didn't deny that the basic of their theory were very much the same uh, idea. Uh, if you look at uh, Jakob von Utskull's uh, functional cycle, it's also a basic uh, cybernetic self-organizing idea. Uh, so they are, in my view, solving Bateson's problem, what is the difference making a difference for? You'll have to produce an individual view viewpoint in order to make differences. It's not possible to do that from a universal observer uh, viewpoint as such. So the uh, autopoetic idea is actually also anti-informational. I mean, this autopoetic system that's self-organized is interacting with the environment, but it's not getting information from the environment. There's no information transfer, what the system is doing is it is adapting to the uh, things that disturbs its self-organization as such. So it doesn't make a true model of its environment, it's just uh, changing itself in able to uh, survive as such. Um, these drawings, this is one of Maturana's drawings. Uh, here he is uh, describing the nervous system or the central brain. Um, and uh, he is uh, showing us that the central nervous system is an autopoietic system in itself and that the Put it on. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> the main idea is that the system is self-organized and that the information coming from outside has no privileged position as such. Uh, you could imagine the little man there, here, is me, and you are the brains here, and the little flower here is my theory, which I'm trying to sell you and say, look, this beautiful theory, it's very important for you, for your system. You have to know this. And you're leaning back and say, I'm not sure it's important for my life as such. Why should it be important for my life? 
af LGBT for Nyhedskylds uh, model is, is, is very much the same. There's this construction of a, a cognitive field uh, and uh, we are slowly moving towards that what we see in the surroundings is partly a, a construction of the system in its uh, attempt to, to survive. And um, what Biosimiac has done is later using this model and giving a kind of Persian interpretation of it and saying that these cues are actually signs in the way that uh, Pers defines them. I have been uh, interested then in, in Lumen's theories because uh, Maturana and Varela stays on the biological level as such, and they even over the year moved into a theory of languaging, as they called it, which some thought was a theory of language, but it's actually a kind of, they what they say, it's a coordinations of coordinations uh, that makes the foundation for the possibility of having language as such, they slowly try to develop a kind of biosocial idea, but um, uh, most of us thought it was pretty reductionistic. Uh, but Lumen was actually working in the social sciences, so he took the work of uh, Heinz von Furster and uh, Maturana and Varela and uh, used that to develop a theory theory of triple autophagies. Uh, so he said that the psychic system in itself is also autophagic. And um, so these uh, interactions going on here on the biological level, and when here we have a, a two males competing about a, a female, um, that these are not enough in themselves to be able to understand uh, communication as such although it is possible to couple this with an understanding of what is uh, distinguishing uh, these two systems are actually sign. But Lumen never liked the Persian concept of sign. He was more leaning more toward the Saussurian uh, understanding of this. But I think the interesting thing about um, using Autobrasius' uh, understanding, uh, especially in humans, was that he developed then this idea of the biological, the psychological, and the social communicative systems as such. Um, and there's a closure of each system, which makes it more understandable for us, for instance, that we usually think that we have contact with the whole of our body as such. But when I ask people how they are gallbladder is doing or their hypothalamus or whatever, they have n no idea. There's huge areas of our body we have no contact with whatsoever, although we still think that we are the conscious mover of, of the whole thing. Um, then this is a very, very strange situation that, that we have so little conscious knowledge of, of our um, our body as such, and still when you ask students to express how they feel these days, everybody finds that this is a very hard work to give a, an account of your experiential world as such and put it into words. If you are the master of more than one language, you will find that each of the languages you know are able to do this in different ways and sometimes you would prefer one language expressions for the others um, and we actually uh, accept uh, the work of poets which is actually exactly this to put words to our experiences as such um, and so I like this model it's explaining uh, these uh, different uh, levels as, as such so I, I made this uh, crude model of it uh, where I put the biological autopoiesis in, in the biological level, which I have the, the main body. Of course, the head is also biological, but never mind. Uh, so the psychological body, uh, autopoiesis in, in the head, 
the psychic system, uh, says Luhmann, is not communicating. It's just feeling, experiencing, and thinking. Um, in order to communicate, it has to connect to a communicative system as such. Uh, and those three different kinds of autopoiesis then have to uh, negotiate with each other, make structural couplings, which um, is very interesting. I'm, I'm in a department with a lot of people specialized in, in languages, so we have people who love Italian, Spanish, French, German, Russian. And what we can see is that each of them change their personality when they speak the second language. Some of them even prefer to be in that language and that culture. Uh, and if you have experiences with, with the, I had a Japanese colleague uh, who I came to know as a very relaxed American intellectual until I s saw him meet another Japanese professor and he changed appearances and body uh, exposures and everything in a flash of a second. It's uh, amazing to see how much organization power the, the natural uh, language system has on the rest. I don't know if it changed their feelings and experiences also, but I, I think they, they do. Many of, many of you know Mertin Anderson. Um, I didn't know she spoke Swedish, which is pretty close to Danish. So I was sitting, speaking with her. I knew her for 10 years, only speaking American. And suddenly we shared the Nordic con uh, language and she changed personality in front of my eyes again very, very fast, but it's quite amazing. So uh, Luhmann says the, autopoiesis, the biological autopoiesis is uh, operating in the medium of life, uh, but uh, the psyche and uh, the uh, communicative system are working in the medium of meaning. And then uh, he is to say attacking a lot of uh, humanistic theory by saying that it's not the psyche that communicates in itself, it's silent. Everybody who teaches knows this problem. We can teach the student, look at them, talk with them, and we know they are thinking their complete own thinking. They have their own thoughts. You have no idea what they are thinking about you and your teaching and this course. They're smiling kindly at you and reading the books, uh, but there is this uh, inner silent psychic system that we don't have access to, only communication communicates, says uh, Luhmann, which is a quite uh, provocative uh, way of putting it. So communication is uh, a dance where you try to negotiate uh, a uh, surrounding, an ontology uh, in your embodied interaction as such. This is uh, an area where Lumen and Maturana agrees. This is one of Maturana's hand-wrought uh, models. So the idea is to place the these triple autopoietic systems negotiating meaning in the middle here instead of putting logic and um, using formal logic as the core of uh, rationality and using the transparent of information as as the core here. Um, it's part of our Greek inheritance, uh, the idea that, that logic is somehow uh, the divine connector between human intelligence and the order of nature, the logos. Um, and uh, it seems to be the same uh, mistake as the idea that, that physics is the same as uh, mechanics and that mechanics is the basis of reality as such. So if you look at the computational algorithmic explanations, you have to realize that they are constructed on the basis of mathematical and logical explanation. It's a special area where these two overlap. 
and they are again part of a whole framework of rationality, uh, the Greek idea of, uh, of uh, logic as such, and that's again placed in a system, a metaphysics of, uh, of uh, rationality, which is very much um, coming from Aristotle and, and Plato, the idea of episteme, the idea of cosmos as a rational, organized, beautiful place that connects to the, the human mind, which again is connecting to, to the divine as such. So it's a divinity kind of uh, recognizing itself as such. So there's nothing wrong with uh, computational thinking. It's just important as with mechanical thinking that it works very well on parts of the world, but to make that the foundation of an ontology is, uh, well, maybe not a mistake, but it's not possible to, to use that as the foundation for a transitionary framework as such. So if we instead place the embodied uh, human communication in the middle here, we get another understanding of an ontology. Instead of uh, claiming that uh, we will have a uh, big, a grand story of uh, evolutionary explanation connecting the biological and uh, uh, physical uh, with the social, um, we'll stop trying to solve the riddle of life with science here, or the riddle of meaning here. I mean, how is it that this cosmos, which is without meaning, described in mathematical, physical laws, produce cultures that ev are based on meaning production as such? Uh, how is it that living systems that don't have a self-consciousness uh, uh, are producing us, that we are still a living system with a different kind of, of consciousness from, from the animals? Uh, and how is it that psychic systems are able to communicate? I lost, here it is, yeah, here. So I'm um, questioning a bit if, if it's a good strategy to claim that science is going to give the explanation to these things. So, um, I'm not sure that science is going to solve these <coughs> philosophical problems for us. I'm sure science is going to explain a lot of, of things, uh, describe models of these things, but Science tends to want to explain from here instead of explaining from here and out. And what I'm saying is that we have these prerequisites for explaining that we are in some kind of environment. I'm not giving off uh, um, Peirce's pragmatism as such uh, and being realistic about knowledge. I'm sure our knowledge is about reality in some way but it's also based that we have a, a living embodiment and it's a crucial part of our uh, consciousness as such that we have this inner mental world uh, and again that we recognize other beings as uh, constructed in the same way as we are. And the problem here is try how you unite these different aspects. I think uh, part of the way the first tries to solve this is his idea that logic is semiosis, so that the formal logic is only part of a grander idea of logic, which is based on the whole semiotic idea of signification, um, and that signification and science as such is the basic process to explain any kind of rationality as such, I think it's Gandini who says a sign is what an object presupposes instead of saying that the objects are first and then we make the signs afterwards. So it's an interactive process going on. So it's a kind of, uh, Persis uh, 
idea is a kind of a constructive realism. I mean, we are constructing, this, this model is kind of breathing. We are constructing models of the world all the time, uh, trying to cope with the complexity of the world. And we uh, export these models to the rest of our fellow beings, to our culture, and even cultures interact, and we try to make technology, and we interact with this reality, and we realize that the model on is not good enough. We reinvent the model, improve it, and then we try to export it again. And this is a kind of breathing going on all, all the time. And in doing that, of course, we are making science systems, we are making interpretations all the time. And of course, we're using logic and we're using empirical research. We're using technologies as such. Um, but what is the important, I think, of biosemiotics is that so far we agree a system needs to be living in order to produce intentional science. And this is the foundation of, of biosemiotics as such. We are, of course, discussing the limits of that. Uh, can we go even further than uh, the living systems? But so far, this is the foundation of uh, uh, biosemiotics, that this autopoietic living system is what makes possible to have an individual view of the world. And the individual is the one that constructs science, not completely alone, but because they're always uh, together with other individuals and as uh, Wittgenstein says, there are no private languages as such. I mean, you need somebody else to construct a language. Twins are the minimal unit of producing languages and we know the twins actually produce languages, uh, but they seldom hold out in the culture when they have to communicate with other people as such. So it's Peirce's idea that the triadic sign is a, a more dynamic uh, view of uh, what communication is and what perception is as such. Um, it's uh, actually a process view, a relational process view, uh, and it's uh, actually a bit difficult to explain it because every aspect of the sign is related to one of his three categories as such. Uh, but I'm sure we'll hear more about that. I don't have time to go deeply into Percy's theory here. Um, and then Percy's idea is to develop this idea of science, of types of science. Uh, here is bain, mainly a, a trichotic way of understanding science. Uh, related to themselves, to the object, to the interpretant, uh, making uh, nine different types of uh, science as such. Here's an indexial sign. I was trying to take a picture of this Greenland whale when I was there, and I only got the sign uh, flow, uh, which indexed for me that when I tried to convince my wife, it was there, I saw the whale. Uh, we only, she believed me uh, because of this indexical sign. And he then uh, combined these uh, basic sign types that you rarely see uh, from themselves. They are kind of uh, the quarks of the elementary uh, sign types uh, in Percy theory, so you don't see an, an icon alone, you have to combine it with a ream and a poly sign to get the sign of a feeling. So it's an important part of his theory that if I tell you that I feel jet lagged, I mean, it's a, it's a sign. So my recognition of my own internal views or feelings are also mediated by signs. There are no experience that is more basic than the sign I'm conveying because in the moment I recognize, I am able to characterize things that go on inside of me or in my embodiment as such, I am making a sign. So 
all perception is sign driven. And I'm not going to go into this uh, complex uh, idea. It can be expanded to is it 66 and even more. So his basic idea is if he makes this uh, uh, semiotic classification system, he will be able to classify all the different types of perception of experiences and then as a basic of communication and a semiotic rationality would a be able to produce a much wider, much more rich idea of uh, rationality that would combine what we today call logic and meaning on, on the two uh, sides. Um, so there's some commonality between Peirce theory and information theory because Peirce say that everything then is sign-based. I mean, our perception, our reasoning, all aspects of cognition, communication as such is sign-based. Uh, so every thought is a sign, every feeling is a sign. Actually, uh, Peirce views feelings as a very basic aspect of consciousness as such and uh, believe that we are using, we are thinking in feelings first of all. So Peirce idea of uh, there's a firstness of feelings, there's a uh, hyper complexity of feelings, this uh, uh, flow of consciousness in every now uh, is what he would call firstness. And this is uh, another way of formulating the idea of qualia that we see in, in discussion of uh, uh, philosophical discussions of, of uh, consciousness as such. So he formulates this as, uh, as firstness and as a very basic thing. So he doesn't have to go back and then try again and give a uh, natural scientific uh, uh, theory of feelings and explanations of where feelings come from. They are basic in his theory because it's phenologically based as such. So it means that all reasoning, uh, all cooperation of the production of in interpretants um, in, in a, a Persian worldview as such. Um, so science, in his view, is not passive things. They have a certain kind of life in themselves because they are processes as such. They are interacting with other science in the sign networks and the, the, these networks of science are what is creating our consciousness, our self, um, our self understanding and it's basic of communication is a network of science going through our body, through our community, um, from the basic organization to the highest uh, complicated uh, types of organisms or social uh, systems as such. They are all uh, completely uh, based on, on, uh, on science that to a certain degree develop in their self. Science have a life of their own as such. Uh, and he's characterizing the human self as a symbol because the symbol is the most dynamic sign. The symbol is able to, to grow all the time whenever the symbol is used in new ways, interacting with other signs, uh, the symbol grows. So his view of ourself is, is as a, a symbol that uh, grows all the time. Um, so therefore, the central part of, of, of semiotics and biosemiotics will be signed systems uh, that are constituted through codes instead of universal laws. Things are determined by codes. Codes are much more contextual related than universal laws. So we have this idea of the code is central to the out of Vedic system trying to make sense of its uh, environment. 
uh, through codes, but we also have codes internally. So a lot of our endosemiotics, the semiotic processes going on inside the body, how different uh, organs communicate with each other. For instance, it's important from my heart that uh, when I'm standing here and talking and doing these uh, movements, that my heart adjusts to being able to support me when I'm doing it. So it's very important that the different organs are able to communicate. And that is not done in a machine way, it's done in a very dynamical idea of, again, based on my own idea of how I should look and behave, giving this lecture to you today, which is holding me up, so to say, uh, when I'm speaking, um, is, is regulating the whole system and this uh, net of sign dynamical uh, network as such. So if you want to go back and, and, and speak about information theory, then it's possible, but it would always be in a semiotic uh, aspect of, uh, of communication or um, of uh, perception as such. Um, so information is always a part of a sign. So it's not possible to start with information and develop into the signs. It's possible to start with the basic semiotic theory and view information as aspects of signs, and which is the way actually uh, Peirce did work with information theory and, and uh, um, did a lot of, of, of work on, on this. Uh, we've there's a book coming out now on, on the ontolo ontology and epistemology of information where I have a and uh, Winfried Nöth has a chapter also about Peirce's understanding of, of information. So it's important that it's through the science you're actually able to negotiate uh, that bridge between the informational view and the technological uh, hermeneutical view of the world as such. So what I am saying here is then, then to add to, to the, the first figure, we'll also have these three levels of perception. There's a very basic, uh, autopoetic, uh, structural way of uh, relating to the world. I mean, while I'm speaking here, I am orienting my body towards you. I'm trying not to hit the table, stuff like that. Uh, I'm relating to you as biological, uh, beings uh, at the same on an instinctual level. I'm clearly distinguishing between males and females uh, while I'm speaking and thinking of higher things uh, uh, and, and talking to you here on this conceptual level. But there is a reason that most of us prefer to watch people speaking in live instead of in television, for instance, because we get much more information from these other levels. So it's very clear that when uh, humans communicate, we have all these systems working parallel here. Uh, you can imagine that this guy is actually saying something to this girl, and she may not be aware of her bodily communications, but they're working very fine. And I'm sure that the girl standing to the left are very conscious about what is going on, which uh, these guys may not be. So it's just an example of these parallel systems that are working all the time. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to combine these autopoetic levels with a biosemiotic uh, way of viewing these things. I think it's we need to develop uh, these levels in order to uh, use biosemiotic as a bridge between the sciences and the social science and the humanities as such. Um, so it means that communication will have these levels. Also, there'll be a, this very basic level in, in the languaging that Maturana describes, and there'll be this level of Bonnitschkund's uh, Umwelt, where we, uh, I mean, I only see what I can see, um, 
when I discuss a party with my wife afterwards, she has often seen a lot of things that I didn't see, and I saw things that she didn't see either. Um, so, uh, and that's probably, some of it is at least gender-based. Uh, and then we, of course, discuss it in a common uh, natural language of the culture in which we are in embedded. Um, so I say there's a parallel uh, among a lot of things that we do on, on the biological level using sign stimuli, for instance, in mating here, if you remember my last example, um, two uh, things that uh, Lakoff uh, and Johnson developed uh, about uh, idealist cognitive mechanisms um, going on here. I think uh, Lakoff seemed to be more and more interested these days in just mapping these uh, Idea is cognitive mechanism directly on the brain, where I would say that we need to uh, have this uh, semiotic, uh, phenoscopic idea of uh, of uh, motivation. Uh, it's uh, another way of understanding motivation, and it's because uh, pers actually start in a phenoscopic way that he can develop these signs. Uh, and that signs are not completely rational things, they are also emotional things, so they are actually a part of what constitutes uh, the, the human consciousness as such. So here you have another example of, uh, of this uh, mating behavior here. I mean, human and biological things are going on at, at the same time, and a lot of the body movements, the people, doing them are not aware uh, until afterwards and somebody tells them, uh, look, you look ridiculous. <coughs> you know that um, social interaction when you deal with people who are falling in love. <coughs> so the final little model is that we actually have this system going on on the communicative level, on the perceptual level, and, on, and in our internal organization, um, there's now a discipline called endosemiotics that uh, is interested in what I talked about, how the different organs communicate, how we use the hormone, hormonal system, the nervous system, and the immune system to negotiate uh, inside of us, creating what some call a biological self as such. It's a biosemiotic-based uh, uh, self, which is this embodied self that distinguishes radically from robots as such. So here we're using this idea of the semiotic dynamic uh, and science that are <coughs> not only rational but also <coughs> emotional as the internal organizer of our bodily awareness. What I call phenosemiotics here is then <coughs> the signs from our emotions uh, and thought semiotics are then when we get a language and use that to classify our emotions. I mean, am I feeling good? I take a teenager, a teenager not aware if she has a stomach ache or she's in love. I mean, how do I apply these concepts? to what I experience. Um, so uh, the, co the natural cultural language is very much a classification of our internal states and as such uh, it, it, it will mean that, that different cultures have different experiences for instance of uh, what love is or what uh, bravery is or what honor is and stuff like that. And uh, it has uh, long-lasting effects here. Um, and then the connection between body and mind, that's such a big problem for uh, Descartes and dualists as such, will be a semiotic negotiation between those two self-organized systems here. <coughs> and our psychological existence is an ongoing negotiation with our body. Those of us who have uh, passed 60 will know 
that we keep on trying to negotiate with the body, which is never exactly what the psyche uh, would prefer it to be and do. Uh, so there is an internal negotiation going on all the time. Yes, that will be the end, and I need some water. <laughs> Thank you.